I just thank God for each and every person. I thank the Lord for what he's doing in people's lives. And we just want to share some good news with you to really let you understand that the Father is touching those that the Lord has put on your heart to pray for. And um, he's been ministering to a lot of people. And we just thank God for all that he's doing. But if you all recall the guy that I told you that he has three sons and another one on the way, and they're only going to be, a, 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 you know, nine months apart, nine and two months apart. And um, so he needed more patience, and he didn't know how to deal with the anger and the patience that he needed. So, but uh, even though we didn't get a chance to say anything to him that much, except, you know, a few things that the Father had me say, I saw him this past week, and guess what? His whole countenance totally had changed. It is so wonderful, you know, this realm, that, you know, you don't really necessarily have to say a word. But the Father, you know, does, because Christ is in each and every one of us, and so he has you go home so Christ can minister to that person by his Spirit to bring a change in their life. And that's the beautiful part about it is, and he had the biggest smile on his face. He said, I don't know why, but I'm just doing so much better. <laughs> Uh, they didn't give me a chance to tell them, but, <laughs> but anyhow, the Lord gets the glory anyway, right? So uh, we just thank God. And uh, before we get to rolling here too, or which we are already rolling, but um, I just want to tell you that Blanche, you know, sent me a text, a long text, and she has really been going through it. But she knows because of everybody is in there for her. This is why she is getting as far as she's gotten. And she just thanks God for our prayers. She has suffered dearly with a lot of pain and a lot of weakness. And uh, so we send her flowers. Uh, she'll get them tomorrow. And I let her know that it was from each and every one of you all here at Lord of Life Ministry. And that we're all rooting for her and praying for her. Isn't God good? And so, whatever it takes, you know, for people, that's when they're going through things. And I keep reminding her, you know, that God will be faithful. He always is faithful. And I know that there's things that's happened with you all, too, with your friends, and I just thank God for that. I know that uh, Sister Joyce had a friend that, that uh, a woman that really loved the Lord with all her heart and uh, had even a word that she would uh, declare the works of the Lord, that she would live and declare the works of the Lord. And so the individual that the Lord gave that to couldn't understand why her friend wasn't alive and that passed away. And when I got off the phone, the Lord just spoke real clear. She's alive. She's not dead, she's alive. I ministered to her on the other side, and she will declare the works of the Lord. So, so, you know, it's wonderful to not lean on your own understanding, but when we don't understand things, it's really difficult. And I thank God for the understanding that he has given us here, and that really challenges us to go on with him. And so we want to continue on with what we were sharing with you last week, and I really will have to repeat some of it because a lot of you were not here and you really need to know what the Lord has brought out. And because the word is really based on that, and we need to get us started on it, because the Father has really put on my heart some things that you need to hear that God wants to say today. And I just uh, thank the Lord to have the privilege to bring forth the things that he has and what he wants. And I want you to really pull it out of me. Are you hungry? Are you really hungry? Are you really, really hungry? Well, now, really, really pull it out, okay? <laughs> if you're hungry, just pull it out, and it'll come out. And that's what God wants you to really hear, what he has to say. He wants you to give full attention to his word. He wants you to give full attention to him and to who he is and allow him to really stand up and do what he wants to do today in a vessel.
for his glory. And we just praise the Father to have the opportunity to let him do what he wants to do. As we shared with you last week, the Lord, you know, has been really speaking to us a lot about different things. And so I just thank God that he did use the group, like I said before, to really minister to the people in New York City, that if we had not got in there when the Father told us, then the train would have gone in the river and all those lives would have been lost. And then the Lord said there was another event getting ready to take place that would be worse than that one. And so then he started putting, you know, on our hearts to let Christ start interceding for this event that's ready to take place. And last Wednesday, uh, before the Thursday meeting, I've lost track of time. It's been maybe a little before last Wednesday, but it was on a Wednesday night before the Thursday meeting. And uh, it was the Thursday meeting before last week. And so it was that Wednesday night. And um, I had a dream, and in the dream there was a vision. And so even though you've heard it before, you need to hear it again, let it get in your spirit, and just those that did not hear it, let them receive it as well by the grace of God, because we're rejoicing over it, and we just praise God for the opportunity to let us know what is going on. Over the years, since 1989, you know the Lord has said that he's coming soon. And then, maybe three years ago, he revealed a horse that he was galloping on, and really fast, and he was coming very, very fast in all of his glory. And he said, I am coming soon. And so then, he revealed himself again, and then at that time, I noticed that the horse was going even faster and was much closer. But the one, what happened was on Wednesday night, which was really important because in, in the dream, I had a vision. And the vision was, and to have the opportunity, and it's really, like I said before, there is no words that I can really express what the dream brought out. But it was just absolutely extraordinary and extraordinary and awesome because we serve an awesome God. We serve a God that is absolutely tremendous, and he really is truly the most high God, and he is so awesome. And so in the dream, all of a sudden, as I was communing with the Lord in the dream, then all of a sudden, I knew, I opened my eyes, and there he was right in my face, and he was completely in my face, right up to my face, and then all of a sudden, he opened my eyes to let him see all of his glory, and he let me see all the light and all the fire that was all around him, and the radiating of the light was going out into the universe. It was going out as fast as it could. It was going, it was beyond. I couldn't even see the end of it. It was just going out into the universe, and I knew that light was nothing but his truth, and he was really revealing his truth, and he was declaring himself to awaken man, and for man to wake up in this hour. But then all of a sudden, he revealed nothing but all his angels that was with him. And there was a vast of angels. I couldn't even see the end of these angels. I couldn't see the end of them. And they were saying, Hosanna, 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 the Lord, the Lamb of the Most High God. And they were just worshiping him. And they were just singing and worshiping. And all these angels were all around him. And I began... I began to weep before the Lord, and I asked the Lord, why are you so close to me? Why are you in front of my face? And he said, because I am trying to get to you to understand that's how close I am. I'm close in your face now because I'm about to come, Joyce. I am about to come. He said, I'm going to come quickly. I'm going to come suddenly. And he said, when I come, I am. And what he was revealing was, and he even spoke to me in uh, Matthew chapter 17, he spoke to me that he was coming in all of his glory of his heavenly father, all the glory of his father, and that he was coming with all of his glory and with all the angels, and that he was basically at that particular time, he was coming with his reward, and he was going to be there to give the reward. And also in Revelations chapter 22, it says that he is coming, he's coming, you know, at that time, it says he's coming suddenly, but in the Revelation, I believe it says he's coming quickly. And so that's why he said, I am coming suddenly, I am coming quickly, before you even realize, I am coming. And he said, you need to tell my people that are even in the midst of the body here, that you need to tell my people and start 
start praying for the sons again because they need to make preparation and prepare themselves for this is truly the hour of preparing yourself for the coming of your beloved, the becoming of your master, and not allowing anything to distract you from the purpose and the plan that God has called you. And so therefore, he wants you to understand the, that purpose for he wants you to be in his will and his purpose and his plan and his coming because he wants you to receive the reward. And all those who have been faithful and true and have walked and been obedient to him, their reward that they will receive is nothing but all of the glory of their heavenly father. And so all of a sudden he said, Joyce, when I appear, my sons will appear like me. He said in 1 John, 1 John came in my mind real quick, and he said, Joyce, now you are the sons of God. He said, beloved, has how much God's love has bestowed upon you, and how much God's love has bestowed on each and every one of you the privilege to be called into the place that he has called you to, to be his, you know, beloved, and to be able to walk and become the overcomers, the sons of God. And he said, you know, those that will walk all the way with me, they will inherit all things. They will inherit all things. And so therefore, he said, there's some that is off track. There's some that are really involved in certain things that are distracting them from what I have called them to and the purpose and the plan that I have for each and every one of them. And they need to ask me, what is causing me to be distracted? And so in the Thursday meeting, the next day, I wasn't going to tell anyone because I wanted to seek the Lord more on it before I've shared it with anyone. And at the meeting, I didn't have a chance to bring everything out as to what brought out in the meeting, but basically what the Father was saying is that, that his plan will go accordingly, and that what he is doing through the vessels that are being obedient and allowing him to intercede through them in this hour, that many are being, will be saved, many that will lose their lives and will be lost completely and not even be able to really and even physically die. He said, many will be saved by allowing me to, you know, stand up in you and to intercede in this hour. And so again, at the end of the meeting, the weight was extremely heavy, which you know what the weight is. It's the minds of people that God is dealing with, and he desires to wake them up. And he's been having us to really intercede for his sons, and he's been even having us to intercede for those that are here in this body, because he does not want any of you all to miss it, none whatsoever, because you've come so far in God. But what I did see is that he's going to bring those that have been obedient, and when he appears, we will be like him. In other words, we will just be nothing but immortality in a body. It, you know, this body that is decaying, this body that is decaying and aging, you know, come on here what I'm saying, because of the resurrection power that is in you and that God is in you, he is going to resurrect you by the life of that resurrection power that is inside of you and you're going to come into the immortality of Christ and they will not see you but they're going to see Jesus, they're going to see the glory of our Heavenly Father because this is what the Father wants you to understand and the enemy is doing everything he can to tempt you to get you off track and to get you to go in this direction and that direction and God does not want you to be distracted he wants you to really focus on the purpose that he's called you to and the responsibility that he has given you in each and every one of your positions and so at the meeting at the end of the meeting I knew he was working on it but I didn't really want to say anything and he did bring out, you know, that the Lord was saving many lives. And so because we were allowing him to do what he wanted to do in this hour. And then the Lord said, now you are to tell them. No, 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 before he said you are to tell them, he kept saying, it is here, it is here, it is here. And I asked the Holy Spirit, why do you keep saying it is here? Why do you keep saying it is here? He said, because it is here. It's here. It's now. It's here, Joyce. Everything that I have revealed is here now. It's here. So he said, make preparation and tell them to prepare themselves. 
And so when the Lord had me to share with them, all of a sudden the weeping of the Lord came all over me, and basically we were crying and interceding because of all these people that we see that really are lost, and they really don't know and have any understanding, and they're all in the cares of this world, and a lot of the Christians, and a lot of people, not everybody, but many people are still in the world, and still, you know, they love the world more than they love the Father. He said the enemy is wearing out the saints of the Most High. He said the enemy thinks to change times and to change the laws of the land. And that's what's going on right now. The beast, that fourth beast is the fourth world empires, is the kingdoms of this world, and man thinks to change the time and also change everything. But the beautiful part about it is, and he's trying to wear out the saints of the Most High God, but the good news is, God will, and that's what he's doing. And at the coming of the Lord, guess what he's going to do? He's going to bring down and subdue everything that is opposing the kingdom of God. Absolutely everything. He's doing it right now in degrees. But I tell you, he, the fire of the Lord, because he has such a fire, you know, that he's going to consume things and he's going to bring every opposition, everything that is against the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God will be established completely in the earth. And so therefore, that's why the Lord has given the saints and the most high God of the kingdoms of this world and because he will be one that will take over the world completely to establish his kingdom in the earth. Isn't God good? So the dream that I had, I'm not finished yet, there was a, while I was in the spirit and the Lord was communing with me, that all of a sudden there was someone that walked in my house. They didn't even knock on the door, but they walked in my house and then they walked in my bedroom. And it was a minister that I know. And he walked in and he had a book in his hand. And he walked in and he says, Sister Joyce, I had to come and see you. I had to come and talk to you. He had something in his left hand, something in his right hand. He said, I gotta talk to you, Sister Joyce. I need to talk to you. And I says, okay, but he said, I need to tell you about this book. And he held up the book in his right hand. And I said, could you just listen to the dream that the Lord just gave me and the vision that he just gave me before you say anything? And so, anyhow, he let me say it, you know, and then he says, oh, you know, Sister Joyce, some of that's in this book. Some of that's in this book. And he said, I got to go get some water. So he went and got a drink of water, and then he came back in. When he came back in, he held the book up again. And then he proceeded to talk about the book. But the thing in his left hand ignited the book. It ignited the book, and the book caught on fire and burned it up. Burned his hand up and burned the book up completely. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, my judgments are present in the earth. I will burn up everything that offends the kingdom of God. And I will burn everything up that's in my sons that is not like a me. And he said, I want you to understand that this is the day that I will, and who could stand in this day by God is a consuming fire. And so then he began to talk to me about Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. And as you can know, the, the, the messenger that was coming at that particular time, and we know that it was talking about Jesus, we know that it was talking about John the Baptist at this time, and God began to tell me a long time ago, a long time ago, in Malachi chapter 3, he said, Joyce, he said, I want you to understand that Billy Graham is a John the Baptist. And so that was several years ago. And he said, the day is coming that I'm going to take him home. And when it's near for him to come home, you know that it's near for my coming. Lord, have mercy. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I never forgot that. 
I never forgot it. And then all of a sudden, the Lord, you know, you know, someone said he was on television, and he's talking about, you know, everybody walking in faith, and they're taking him back to some of his ministry back in time. But, you know, the Father said, I'm getting ready to take him home. I'm getting ready to take him home. And so, you know, you know, he's going to be on the other side. He's just a sign. He's just a sign. But, you know, you got to understand, the Lord says, who? Who will be able to stand in the day of my coming? Because I am a consuming fire. And who will be able to stand? Because I am a refiner. And I will refine you like fuller, fuller soap and with my fire. And so God, is that's what he's doing. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Y'all get me? And so then we started out last week on Isaiah chapter 66. And I know some of you say, well, this is a repeat, but I'm getting off of this. I'm going to go into some more things, okay? So just hang in there with me, will you? All right. In Isaiah chapter 66, you know, where the Lord said, you know, that, you know, he was the one. If you look at it very carefully, I guess I'll have to go there in just a minute. But everything that it says in Isaiah chapter 66, it talks about, you know, the Lord himself. It talks about God, you know, and what he's doing in our life. It talks about... uh, that the Lord is a refiner, and he refines us with his fire. And then it talks about where he has, he's the one that laid afflictions upon our loins. And years ago, I asked the Lord, what did that mean? You mean you laid affliction upon my loins? And you mean you're the one that let me go through the fire? And you also let me go through the waters? And yet you bring me out on the other side? And so what is he bringing me out to? He's bringing me out into a wealthy place. That's what he's bringing you out to is a wealthy place. And so that's why he said, he said, Joyce, there's a balance in the whole thing. He said, some people go through the fire because they're the ones that cause the fire, because they're disobeying me. And some, you know, don't go through the fire, but it's because, you know, I want them to reproduce. He said, you know, the affliction is upon the loins because that is the reproductive area. And so in order to be a part of the first fruit company, and so in order to come into that place that I desire you to come into, you must understand that it's vitally important for you to really understand what I am doing in this hour. And he said, you know, unless, you know, you go through the fire because the fire is what burns these things out that is not of me. And so therefore, he said, this is what I'm doing. He said, all my sons right now are going through the fire. And the reason they are is because I desire to bring change in their life. And I desire for them to come forth in much fruit, not just in fruit and not just, you know, very, but much, much fruit, 100 fold. You got the, you know, the 30 fold, the, I believe it's the 60-fold and the 100-fold. And so that's the 100-fold is the first fruit company. And so this is what I want you to understand, and the only way that you can do that is be obedient to me and let me have my way in your life. And he said, I allow these things to happen so that you can look at your thoughts and you can see the things that are distracting you in this hour. And so this is what I'm dealing with my sons in this day and this time. And he said, this is an hour for you to rejoice. This is an hour for you to praise me. This is an hour to understand that things that you've been waiting for is about to be fulfilled. I am about to fulfill these things that you have desired and you have been waiting for for a long time. Is that not good news? And guess not. Guess what? He didn't say, he didn't say, I'm going to take you out of the fire. No, he said, I'm going to take you through it. You notice that? He's going to take you through it. He brings you out at his appointed time. And then he says, he's taken you through many waters. Okay, what are the waters? The waters is the waters of your understanding. The waters is nothing but the emotions and the thoughts that are negative and that is not like Christ and is not like the Word and absolutely does not represent the Word of God. And so therefore, he's bringing you through the waters. And so the waters will not overtake you. He said they won't overtake you, but you've got to go through the waters. Jesus had to go through the wilderness, all right? And there's times that you have that wilderness experience. But the Father wants you to understand there is a place in him that you keep your eyes on Christ. You keep your eyes on the Lord and on the Word and let the Word cover your mind and always return back to the Word when all these thoughts bombard your mind. Return back to praise and worship and return back to the Word and let the Word cover you. Amen? God. 
God's good, is he not? The Lord is good. The waters of your understanding. Okay, and the waters of your understanding, there's darkness there. And that darkness is nothing but ignorance in man's mind. And there's so many times that our mind ends up into the darkness. But if we don't get back on track again, it's hard to get back on track again. That's why you got to stay with it. You got to stick to it. You got to keep going with that flow with him. And how do you keep going on with that flow with him? All right, what I want to share with you is you are the priest of the Lord. Did not the word say that he's made you kings and priests in the kingdom of God? And he is the high priest, and he is the first son, and always will be. And don't you know, at the particular time in the Old Testament, and also in the book of Revelations, this is what I get so excited about, which we will, you know, try to get into some more. But what I get excited about, and I just thank God for that, you know, is that, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I got distracted. But the beautiful part about it is, is to understand that in the Old Testament, the high priest of the lampstand, there was something that they had to do. And they had to do it, and that was their job. And the candlestick, you've got to understand, is the seven spirits of God. And it's the seven churches. It's the seven churches of the entire body of Christ. So it's speaking about the seven, seven, you know, so the seven candlesticks and the, the center was, is Christ himself. He is the one that is holding up, holding up that lampstand. He's holding it up. Now what the priests had to do, they had to, and we've taught on this before, but I'm back on it again. What the priests had to do, they had to, that was the responsibility. They had to make sure that candlestick burned with light all night long. It had to have light on all night long. It also had to have oil, and they also had to trim the lamp. They had to keep the lamps trimmed. And so therefore, they had to do this every night. And they had, and they had to make sure that was their job. That was what they were supposed to do, because the light was to keep shining in the darkness. The darkness is ignorance and the negative thoughts. You understand what I'm saying? But the beautiful part about it is each one of those lamps, stands, sticks, that went up with the candle, I wish I had a picture of one, when it went up, it had to face toward the center. Had to be always faced toward the center. Because if it was not faced toward the center, the light would go out. Y'all get what God's saying here? Come on, hear what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that that it would go out because it was not facing the center. That's why it says that we are to keep our eyes upon the Lord, and we are to keep our eyes upon the Word. We need to understand that that is really your safety, because you cannot do anything in this in your own strength. But as we really allow Him to consume these negative thoughts, and this is why He is trying each and every one of you, and you're you're you know behaving wrongly in different ways is because the Lord is trying to get your attention because you want you to understand that there are certain ones that will miss it that won't let him have his way. Lord, have mercy. And so we're being proved and we're being tried and we're being tested in this hour for the purpose of what he is getting ready to happen and to come on the horizon. And so I don't know about you, I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm excited because this is the day. Why do you think? I mean, what gets me, what's amazing is here Jesus, here Jesus is. Here he is with all of his glory and all of his power and he created everything in the entire whole earth. And here is God himself. He's an eternal God. He completely was out of time didn't even never had been in time because you got to understand that he was getting ready to come he had to come back and he was willing to lower himself and put himself God himself putting himself inside of a woman come on hear what I'm saying I mean God himself with all the resurrection of power was willing to reside inside of a woman a virgin to really bring forth that newborn baby which was the son of the most high God. And we know that Jesus is God, Emmanuel in the flesh. 
And what gets me is, is that when he really came into full maturity, God brought him in and he began to minister, but he had to go through the wilderness. The dove came up on his head, and so therefore, but then he had to be driven right into the wilderness, and he had to be proved and tried and tested, just like you and I. And so you've got to understand, and what gets me is, you know, Satan himself, and you've got to get this today. Satan himself, when he comes and he puts those lies in your mind, you've got to understand who you are are of the most high God you are he is inside of you and that's what Satan is coming against he's coming against what's inside of you it's God himself Emmanuel in the flesh and here Jesus he had the kingdoms of the world he had everything in the world and he said if thou be the son of God he has to put doubt in your mind he's got to put doubt in your mind if thou be the son of God. And then he offered in the kingdoms of this world. You know, it's like, you know, he's offering God, the almighty God. Come on, hear what I'm saying. It was God in the flesh of Jesus. It was the most high God inside of him. And he offers him the kingdoms of this world when the kingdoms of this world belongs to God anyway and himself. Lord, have mercy. That's why Jesus said that we were not to bow down to any other God, but only bow down to our Heavenly Father and to respect Him. That's one thing about Jesus. If you get this, you've got to understand what happened in the Garden of Eden. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Lord, how mercy. What happened in the Garden of Eden was the will of man brought the fall and it hit everybody. And what happened with Jesus when he went to the cross? He said, with blood on his forehead, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. And so you see, that is the difference. That's the difference. The difference in the Garden of Eden was man's will. The difference in the Garden of Gethsemane was not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, have mercy. Why don't you stand up and shout to the Lord? Why don't you praise God for all of his glory and how great and how wonderful he is and how tremendous he is, how awesome he is. He's an absolutely awesome God. He's an awesome God. He is absolutely awesome. He's tremendous. He's the greatest thing going in the whole entire world. He's eternal. God was willing. He had to leave eternity. He had to leave eternity, and he had to come down into time. Come on, hear what I'm saying. He had to come down into time so that he could take you out of time back into eternity now, and not sometime in the future. Lord, have mercy. You hear what I'm saying? So it's the eyes that gets us in trouble. It's the eyes that gets us in trouble. I'm going to get in Revelation, you know, if I get a chance. I don't know. The eyes is what gets you in trouble. It's the appearance of things that get you in trouble. It's what you see with your eyes. And it's your soul and your emotions and your feelings. What you see people doing and you think that that's the way it is. It's the appearance of things. And I'll give you an example because it's vitally important to understand that we are to not look at things that we see by sight, but we're to look at things that's in the invisible realm. That's what we are to behold, is to keep our eyes. It says in the word that, you know, the, you know, the saints shall not live by sight but we're to live by the faith of God. Amen? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Huh? I'm getting a little warm. I'm going to take that off. The Lord is good. Yes! He is good. I'm going to give you some examples in the Word. I'm asking the Lord which example he wants me to start with. (laughs) I'm going to start with Sodom and Gomorrah. You have to understand that Lot's name really means nothing but darkness. 
Lot's name means the cares of this world. Sodom means wickedness and the Philistines and the sinners. Gomorrah means oppression and depression. It means burning desires for the things that's in the world. Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah because of what was in him. So he was very much in the world. But God was getting ready to burn up Sodom and Gomorrah and to burn all the wickedness that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. But you know what he did? He went because of Abraham and because of Abraham praying for Lot. That's what God did. He went and he sent angels to Lot, you know, to spare him and his family and his wife. You understand what I'm saying? To spare them, not because of, you know, how good he was, but because the individual that was interceding and to blame God for that individual that God would, you know, do what he needed to do because, you know, that's what Abraham was. He he allowed God to intercede for him. And so the Lord decided to spare a lot, and so he sent an angel. And so the angels came, and the angel even told him, he said, you know, I can't even do anything. I can't do anything until you all get out of here. He says, I can't do anything that God wants me to do. And that's what God's trying to do. He's trying to get his sons in the place that he wants to get them in because he wants them to be in the place that he wants them to be in this hour. And so he said, you know, I can't do anything until you leave, but you got to leave now. You got to leave immediately because I must do it. And so therefore you must leave now and he must not stay here any longer. You must not stay. What he was saying, you can't stay in the world anymore. You got to go to this mountain. He said, you got to go this mountain in order to be saved. you got to go it. He said, don't look back either. He said, you got to go. And so therefore, you know, he knew if he went to the mountain, which was a high mountain that he was trying to get him to go to, that he would die. His soul would die. It meant death in his soul. And he said, no, no. He said, you know, can I go over and over the little mountains? <laughs> If I go there, you know, if I go up the other one, I'm going to die. And so that's why a lot of people, they don't want to change because they don't want to die to their self-will. They don't want to die to their self-will. So he said, can I go over there? And the Lord, the angel says, okay, go on over there. So he told him not to look back. And so, but you've got to understand that this is an hour for you and I not to look back. That's the time. You have to understand that what she looked back to, what was she looking back to? She was looking back to the cares of this world. She was looking back to the desires of this world. What was in Sodom and Gomorrah, she was looking back to all of that, and she was desiring it within her heart and not really, you know, wanting to do what God wanted to do. But, you know, God turned her into a pillar of salt. And so that salt was nothing but a sign for mankind to understand what the Father is saying. And I don't have time to go in and minister about the salt because salt does preserve. God preserved her. But she was not able to do what the Father wanted to do. The interesting part about it is the time after, you know, I guess I'm getting it together here. Yes, right after that, you know, um, that particular time in Sodom and Gomorrah, immediately after, Abraham started moving and he started journeying. And so he went to this place and sort of fear was sort of in his heart, I guess because of what he saw, what the father did. But, you know, fear was in his heart. And so therefore he went and he had to go into this country in order to get to the place where the father was sending him and he couldn't go around. And so it was a place that was considered, you know, where the Philistines were. And it was a place to have the understanding that it was a place of Edom. It was a place of, you know, nothing but um, the carnal mind. And so therefore, he went and there was a king there. There was a ruler there at that particular time. And he went in and he lied. He didn't, if you read it, he really didn't lie. But he told the king that, you know, and he told his wife before they went in there, he said, they can't find out who we are, so he said, at least, you know, they do something to us. And so therefore he was protecting himself, and so he used his, his wife and said, 
uh, you tell him that you are my sister. Now, if you read the scriptures, you can really see that she was his sister. Because he married the father, all right, the father of Abraham, right, married again, and so therefore it was the daughter of her father and not the daughter of the mother. And so he wasn't lying, but he used that to protect himself, and he was willing for her to go in, and when he knew that the king might have a relationship with his own wife. And, but in God's mercy, and so you see, he judged that king, again, he, uh, by appearance. He went by appearance of that king. He saw the king, he saw, you know, the area that he was in, and so that he believed that he was a nasty king and that they would kill them, and so therefore he had to use this to back up to where, you know, he's a backup plan, let's put it that way, a protection of himself. The interesting part about it is God is really something. The Lord shut up the wound of everybody in that whole castle. I mean, everyone, everyone, he shut up the wounds to where no one could have any children or anything. And so therefore, and then he spoke to the king himself and he told him, he said, you cannot have a relationship with this woman because she is his wife. And so therefore he was very angry and he went to Abraham and said, how dare you lie to me and tell me. He said, we were being kind to you. I am not the kind of king that all these other people are. We are being kind to you and want to help you out on your journey. And we were going to give you a lot of things to help you out. Even the treasures that he had, he was willing to give him treasures and everything. But you have lied to me. And so then Abraham said, no, I didn't lie to you. She really is my sister from my father's side. But I apologize and I am so sorry. And he asked the king to forgive him. Again, the appearance of your eyes get you in trouble all the time of what you think of other people and how they're acting and how they're behaving and you don't go before the Lord and you don't ask the Lord what's going on and so therefore there's even you know you yourself you yourself here we all misjudge people at times by the appearance of things and one another and so therefore the father wants you to understand this is the hour where we really need to come to a place where we really allow Christ to do the judgment and the correction through us another example and all of you know this Lord have mercy <laughs> how about the leopards The city with the king. The famine was in the land. There was a famine in the land going on today. Come on, hear what I'm saying. And so they put the lepers on the outside and wouldn't let them come in. The Lord, the prophet, came to the king. And the king relied on a person that was in his court and sent the person to the prophet and let the prophet tell this individual that the king leaned upon. You cannot lean upon anyone. You need to lean upon the Lord in this hour. You need to commune and allow him to have his way. I don't know who you're leaning on in this day, but this is the day not to even lean on your own self and not to even lean on your own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all your ways. To acknowledge him in all your ways. To acknowledge him in all your ways. And not lean upon your understanding. And so many times we do. And therefore we get in trouble because of what we're seeing and what we're hearing. And the five senses. So they knew that if they went in, you know, and, and so the prophet told the one that he went to, and the king went, he went back to tell the king. But the prophet, this is what the prophet said. He said today, and he shared with how much, you know, food that they were going to have. And I, I, you know, you can read it for yourself. I don't have the measurements or anything, but what they would be able to partake of to sustain them through this time of famine, you know, of what's going on. And so this prophet really doubted. It's amazing. Let's go there. It's amazing what he said. 
And this is nothing new. We've ministered on it before, too. Amen? Is Second Kings chapter 7, Elijah said, it's Elisha and not Elijah, said, Hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time a measure of fine flour will sell for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. The gate of Samaria, Samaria is nothing but, you know, thoughts of man's mind. Is that, that's the gate that they were living in. Is Samaria is, you know, people that live in the darkness of their mind and ignorance and thoughts that are not of Christ. And then the captain on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But Elijah said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Lord, how mercy. Mm. That is strong words. You have to understand, for they who are of the law will be errors. That's in Romans 4.14. Faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. Listen to that. The promise is made no effect, because he didn't have the faith, and he didn't believe he was going by what he was seeing with his own eyes in the appearance realm, and so therefore the promise that God had given given, you know, through Elisha to tell him, you know, it could not take any effect and would not take any effect. In fact, he said, you will not, you will not, you know, basically it goes on down, and the captain whose hand the king leaned on, it goes on, he said, you shall not see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now four men who were lepers, and it goes on like that, you know, at the entrance of the city's gate, and they said to one to another, why should we sit here until we die? They had more sense than anyone. The lepers did. <laughs> they said, why should we sit here until we die? They said, well, they won't, even if they let us in, there we're there, they have a famine, so there's nothing to eat there, so if we go in there, we're going to die. We're going to die. So, you know, and they started thinking over and over what they should do, and to get to the gist of it, basically they made the decision to go into the enemy's camp because they figured either, you know, they're going to die if they went there and they're going to die if they did this and then they figured they're going to die if, you know, maybe the enemy would take a compassion on them and they wouldn't die. And so faith is action. Faith is action. And what's the, what, what has amazed me when God, you got to understand that when you take action on what the Father has said to you, you know, and this is what the Lord did when he saw what these, you know, lepers were doing, God himself, with the enemy, before they even got there, what is so amazing, before they even, the, the lepers got there, God caused a noise of chariots, like, you know, a whole army of, you know, of people are coming greater and mightier than what was in their little camp. And so they knew that with that noise, I mean, God created the noise. God could do anything. And I'm telling you, we're going to see God do things that we never knew that he possibly, we know that he can do it, but we've never seen it. There is just about to be most miracles and power that you've ever seen what God is getting ready to do. And he wants you to be a part of it. And he he wants you to enjoy him and he wants you to allow him to do these things through you for his glory and for the glory of the Heavenly Father. So the Lord made all the noise and they went in and, and they left the horses, they left everything, they left their money, they left the, the gold, they left everything. <laughs> Everything, they left it all there. They left the food. And so they had all this food, and they're enjoying it all for themselves. But then they realized that they were doing something wrong. They knew that, you know, that that was not making them happy, and they knew that they needed to return back to the king, and they needed to return back and give the things that they need to do with those that were dying in the, you know, in the place. It got something else. So faith is action. It says we walk not by sight 
our appearance in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we will go there in just a little bit. But I want to get to the good part. I want to get to the good part just for a minute. All right, uh, give me uh, my Bible, my old one. Y'all receiving all this? How you doing? We know Revelations is about the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and it's also about the body of Christ, the church. We know that, uh, and the beautiful part about it is, you've got to understand that uh, the four faces of God, and you do know that, we've taught this for years, the four faces of God is the four Gospels. It's the four Gospels. And you've got to understand that Matthew is the roaring line. Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But John is what I want to get into. John is the eagle. John is the eagle. We know, and John, it represents nothing but love. Represents nothing but love. And so therefore, and he was there at the cross when Christ was crucified. He always laid his head on the breast of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we taught on that before, what that really means. So he began to understand what the rest of God was. But they put him on an island and totally separated from everybody. But this is where he had visions. And he was on island Patmos. And God spoke to me and he said, I separate him unto myself completely so that I could give him the visions and give him to where the book of Revelation came from. Isn't God something else? And so that's what the Father did. The beautiful part about it is we go back to the lampstand, like I was talking to you about before, where the, the high priest had to trim the lamps, you know, and the time is coming that you won't have to trim anymore. The time is coming when you don't have to really trim any of those thoughts anymore. Come on, hear what I'm saying. God is about to burn them all up of those that are willing to let him have his way. He's about to burn all those thoughts up. And not only that, the beautiful part about it is, if you can see that the, the job that we have for the lampstand and what it's to do, and the Christ is the center of that lampstand, and we know that the seven, seven candles is the representation of the seven spirits of God, which is nothing but his wisdom. And, and, you know, oh, there's just so much that I want to say. So much that I want to say. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> but, you know, oh, Lord, I, hopefully I can get to it. Oh, here, here we go. All right, in Revelations, you know, Revelations chapter 22, there's no lampstand there. There's no need for one. Lord, have mercy. This is the overcomers. They've let God have his way. So therefore, there is no lampstand, and therefore there is no night there. They don't have a night ever again. There is no more negative thoughts in their mind. Come on, hear what I'm saying. There's no thought that is not like God. They let God have his way, and they let God change their mind, and they begin to understand what it means to behold the Lamb. They understood what it means to always continue to look unto the Lamb when they knew they had fear there or whatever they have. Or, you know, it even says the liar has to go into the fire. If you're still lying, honey, you're going to be going in the fire, and there's going to be some people that's going to miss it because Christ himself, he even said that he that really is going to, even though you, you have great visions and you have knowledge and you lay hands on the sick and you deliver people, he said, you know, he said, it's those that do the will of my Father will be the ones that will enter in. It's he that doeth the will of my Father. So you have to understand in his faith, it is also doing and being obedient to him and a being obedient to his word. And let me tell you, the young people, they're looking for something. They desire something. They know there's got to be something more than what they're hearing. And I want to tell you, the woman that I met in, in the bank, God bless her soul, I went in there again and I walked in 
And the Lord said, I want you to talk to her. And I want you, and she said, where have you been? I've been looking for you every week. You have really, 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 I, you know, I'm so hungry. And she said, I am devouring everything off of the website. And so I began to, the Lord said, share the vision with you that you had and the dream that you had. And so I did. And so it was the same week that I had heard from the Lord in the dream. She said, oh my Lord, oh my God. She said, you know what? She said, I was, God always gets me up, you know, in the middle of the night or early in the dawn in the morning, like three or four. And she said, I was there communing with my Lord. And she said, I had my eyes closed. And she said, all of a sudden, I heard a knock. And she said, the knock was really loud. And she said, my spirit knew it wasn't a person, but you know, it was so loud, I had to open my eyes just to see what was going on. And she said, nobody came in. And so she shut her eyes again. And she asked the Lord, what is this? And he said, I'm saying to you to open your door. He said, I am saying to you, I'm coming. I am coming. I'm here and I'm coming. And he said, clean house. Clean your house and be ready. And she said, Sister Joyce, I got to see you. And so you guys be thinking of them because her husband wants to, too. And so therefore, the father, you know, he's moving. Come on, hear what I'm saying. He's moving. Also, I got a, uh, you know, a message from a person on Facebook, and they said, you know, you know, they came here once before with the sister, and the sister, I won't go into it, but anyway... The thing of it is, he says, Sister Joyce, your prayers are not in vain. He said, you know, I'm basically, I'm ready now. I want to change. They only came one or two times. That was it. But he said, I'm ready now. I want to change. Isn't God something else? Oh, God is good. God is good. Anyhow, there's no lampstand. There's no need for one. There's no sun. There's no lampstand. Because God is their light. They don't need the lampstand anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? Because they've become the word. Their mind has been transformed by the word of God. And so therefore, they're the ones that have leaves, and they're healing the people. The river on both sides, they're healing people in the visible and invisible realm, and releasing and letting the leaves of the healing to go forth and touch the nations. Revelation chapter 22. Oh, Lord, and he showed me a pure as crystal river of water of life, clear as a crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Where's the throne? It's inside of you. God is inside of you. So the river is always flowing and desires, and God wants that river to flow continually, but it doesn't always flow continually because of the thoughts. You see what I'm saying? And because we're not allowing the word to overshadow our mind. Like Mary said, be it unto me according to your word. With God, all things are possible. Then it goes on down and it says, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. So it's people that have become the tree of life which bore 12 kinds of fruit. And it's not an apple either. It's not an apple either. You know, what really gets me, and i got to bring this out, what gets me is we understand that people are celebrating Christmas in this hour and celebrating the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that he was born in the spring. And so the celebration of him should be every day, should be all the time. 
But what gets me is the Lord said, you know, that the turkey tried to take his place, but no God is going to take his place. There's not going to be a turkey's not going to take his place because he's God. But he also told me the bunny rabbit also tried to take his place at Easter, but he said, no bunny rabbit. I mean, can you see Jesus going around, you know, hopping like that and, 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 and trying to find a, an egg or something? You know, my Lord, with flopping ears? I don't think so. And then, you know, what gets me is everybody's celebrating Santa Claus. And when you got to understand, I mean, Santa Claus, I mean, at least they got him flying. But the thing of it is... <laughs> but that's about it. You know, and he's bringing the gifts... And everybody's talking about the gifts that they're going to get. Lord, how mercy. You know, and what God is doing. They're going, you're, you're seeing people now with trees on their cars and everything. But what really gets me? Well, God, you know, what really means about what God is saying is it took away from what he was really saying. Because what he was really saying that you are trees. And he's cut you down. And he separated you unto himself. Come on, hear what I'm saying. And also, he puts the lights, the lights that's going on you. These lights are to shine day and night. That's that's why the lamp stand. That's why we got to keep looking to the Lord until our minds are being transformed. But all night long, people keep their lights on. They keep their lights on all night long. But it's a symbolic. It's nothing but, you know, this is what God meant by it. And he also meant, you know, oh, Lord, how mercy. All the things that they put on and the decorations and everything. He said, I am adorning you. I'm adorning you. I'm adorning you. I'm the one that's adorning my trees. I have cut you down and I've set you apart unto myself and he said I am adorning you with my nature and my love and my compassion and he said the gifts I have given you the gifts he said I've given you all the gifts it's not about the gifts underneath the tree he said it's all about my gifts he said, my gift is, I gave you the gift of my love through my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He said, not only that, I gave you the gift of faith. I gave you the gift of peace. I gave you the gift of love. He said, you know, he said, how can people continue to say, he said, I am a God. And in God, there is no darkness. In God, there is no darkness. In God, there is nothing but light. Come on, hear what I'm saying. And if we say that we fellowship with him and we still walk in darkness, it says that we, you know, we have been deceived and we lie. The lie is we get in our self-will and that's the lie. That's the lie from the enemy to get you back in the self-will. It's all about the lie from the beginning. Oh Lord, have mercy. Do you hear what I'm saying? He said, I've given you all the gifts. I've given you my salvation. I've given you my redemption. I've given you my deliverance. And he said, I'm about to give you everything that is supposed to be coming to you, those that are obedient to me in this hour. And he said, people are out there and they're all hustle and bustle and stress and trying to buy this. And maybe they're not buying as much because the economy in this hour, but they're depressed because they don't have the money to buy gifts and so forth. But the thing of it is, Lord, have mercy. God is saying, it's about me. And what I've done for each and every one of you. And he said, did I not take the cedar trees from the mountain and I build my house with those trees? He said, you're the tree and I'm building my house and you're my house. And I've given you all those gifts. And the Bible says that if we really don't walk in darkness, we can fellowship with one another. There's still darkness in our mind. Then there's a click among the group. And they only fellowship with certain ones because of the click. Lord, have mercy. God's not into clicks. He's not into any of that. Fellowshipping with one another, loving one another. This is really where it's at, brothers and sisters. It's all about the love of God. And the world's going to see God's love. They're going to see his son. And they're going to see his glory. And that's what he's going to express through his trees. And so these people finally come to the place where they don't need a lampstand anymore. They've become it. 
It's be about becoming, becoming more like him and allowing him to change you. How many of you receive all that? All right. If you go on down, it says there shall be no uh, night there, and there will be no lamp, verse uh, 5, and neither the light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Isn't it really something that the overcomers will be ruling and reigning throughout eternity, without time? Lord, because many others will be born. And they need to receive the truth of God. Isn't God something? The Lord is something else. He also, in Revelation chapter 12, if we have time, we'll go over the whole thing. But it says, Behold, I come quickly. And Matthew 17 says, I come suddenly, and my reward, reward is with me to every man according as his work shall be. For I'm Alpha, Omega, and the beginning and the end the first and the last. And he is. He is Alpha, the making, you know, the beginning and the end. That he is. Right? He is. Okay, one more thing, and I, I'm, I'm, I really didn't get a chance to get into it. But we can stop here. Let me see if the Lord wants me to stop. Uh, wait, wait a second. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I did quote it. I quoted it. Um, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seventeen, which you, for our light affliction is slight. Actually, you know, the only, one, the only way that the Lord can bring you into complete perfection, that perfect man, is through suffering. That's how he perfects you. <laughs> through the suffering we go through at times, you know. Some of the suffering we bring on our own self, though. For our light, notice it says a light affliction. Notice there's just a moment. How can you compare a moment to eternity? You can't. You cannot compare a moment to eternity. No. And he says, <clears throat> slight distress of passing hour is ever more and more abundant, preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory. He's the one that achieved it for an everlasting weight of glory. And it says here, um, beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast transcendent glory, blessedness never to cease. Since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. So that's really where God is trying to get us to. All right? For the things that are visible are temporal. Very brief. And fleeting. But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. So the things that you're driven to is not everlasting. When you're in self-will and you're after things, it brings nothing but death. The love, you know, we lose sight of God and the things of this world, which we shared that with you last week. But the good news is, if you go on up, the next one, and we'll give this for Janice, so Janice can hear it. It goes on down, and it says, For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed or dissolved, 
we have from God a building, a house. There's a teaching in that too. I don't have time to get in it. Verse two, here indeed is this present abode body. We sigh, we groan inwardly because we churn, we yearn to be clothed over, we yearn to be clothed over with our celestial body like a garment to be fitted with our heavenly dwelling so that by putting it on, we may not be found naked without a body. Of course, we know, you know, the spirit needs the body in order for the spirit to reside in, all right? But he said, for while we are still in this tent, we groan under the burden and sigh deeply, weighed down, depressed, oppressed, not that we want to put off the body, the clothing, which is the clothing of the spirit, but rather that we would further be clothed so that what is mortal, our dying body, may be swallowed up by life after the resurrection. But God is swallowing it up even now as we become the Word and let the Word of God change us as we really do what the Father wants us to do. So now he who has fashioned us, preparing and making us fit for this very thing in God who is also given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the fulfillment of his promise. You ought to underline that one. So that when we're always full of good and hopeful and confident, so then we should always be full of good and hopeful and confident courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are abroad from the home, which is it's better in the King James because you're not abroad from the home of the Lord because the home of the Lord is inside of you. He's everywhere. I'm not doing away with heaven. I'm just saying he's in us and that eternal realm is beyond matter. And it's all around us. And when we get in the spirit, you're right in that eternal realm. But the time is coming, you're going to walk in it all the time and you're never going to come out of it again. The soul will be completely swallowed up. So it says we're supposed to walk by faith. All right, and, to, and have respect for God and not walk by sight or appearance. It's right there in the word. That's in verse 7. Not walk by appearance. And that isn't easy. Anybody think it's easy here? If you do, you want to raise your hand? I don't think I'll get anybody to raise their hand on that one. What do you think? I don't think so. He is Alpha and the Omega. So we really got to really understand that the Father wants us to live by the faith of the Son of God. And as we keep looking to him, he will bring it to pass. Amen? Are you ready to shout, or are you just ready to just zip your bag and go home? Why don't you stand up and give him a hand? Now I want you to look at each other and say, I am going on because of Jesus. I am going to continue. I am going all the way. With the help of my Lord. All the way, dear. Let's uh, hold hands for a minute. I didn't wear my brace today. Hmm. So. Yeah.